Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships, and I want to remind each of you right now, coming up August 2nd, our next Walking Through Calvary Zoom, where we not only counsel you in the greatest uh, challenges you may be having right now in your family, your marriage, your relationships, whatever it might be, but also you might be recovering from a very painful situation of a failed marriage, something of that nature. Whatever it might be, we are here to walk you in it, to awaken you to truth and walk you in it. Remember, when you're awakened to truth, you know and understand what your needs are. When we walk you in it, you're transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to obey the truth that you're given. And as I go into this session now, I want you to consider the fact that what we're sharing here is something very relevant to what we will be doing at Walking Through Calvary. And that is to realize that we have an opportunity to know Christ in a way that he will have transforming power in you and me. When we are transformed, the best way to see our loved ones get transformed are by seeing the transformation in us. You've probably heard me say, the best way to change another is to begin by letting God change you. So let's get ready to walk in it. And the title today, it's a little bit confusing. I even changed it here at the last moment. I drew it from the, uh, the motto of this nation in 1776. It's a Latin phrase, e pluribus unum. And it means... Uh, out of many, one. So the first part of the title was to be Christ in you, out of many, one, that we serve one. And then you in Christ, one out of many. Hopefully you're one out of the many that are serving him because everything about your life, your purpose, your destiny, your legacy is wrapped up in who it is that you serve, who you believe, because if you believe anyone less than the power and the sovereign uh, infinite wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are walking on a blind path that will take you nowhere. There is no purpose without it. The, the, this phrase, once again, e pluribus unum, means out of many, one. The reason it was the motto of the United States is because each of the various locations in the New World were set up as colonies that eventually became states. They realized quite quickly if they were going to defend themselves, they had to be united. But yet they knew separation was important too so that they could be individualists, people that could pursue the, their own destiny, their own purpose under God. So they said, we don't have to agree on any everything. Let's agree on this. Let's be unified. Let's be united. United we stand, divided we fall. So this Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, actually means out of many became one. Out of many states became the full United States. The union actually was created by all these separate states with different beliefs and priorities of how they wanted to govern. Yet they were one body and one nation to protect themselves from foreign adversaries. There's one thing you can be sure of when you, when you are filled in a world, a fallen world with fallen people. You're going to have disputes that eventually lead to war. It's unfortunate, but man has never been able to sustain peace at all. Only Christ will be able to do that fully, completely when he begins his millennial reign. So they were united, that is the union, for a reason, for a purpose far bigger than them. In other words, they had to realize that them as one was not enough to be able to survive and to be able to defend. But many ones, out of many, one, this one United States, that we became, this United States, the deliverer of so many oppressed nations that were taken in... Uh, in, in tyranny uh, by war, in World War I and World War II. And thank God, because without this, uh, the great uh, sovereignty of God over this nation, we were the only ones able and capable of setting free all these peoples of the world that were under uh, this uh, servitude and, and this tyranny. So 
They never had to be united in their opinions. God help us. What are opinions? I mean, what value are they? We, I like my opinion. You like yours. But so what? Well, I'm not going to order my life after your opinions. I hope you don't take that personal. I would expect that you would not order your life after my opinions either. Now, if I'm presenting truth to you, not my truth, the truth of the Word of God, now that's a different story. You may want to pay attention. You may want to consider ordering your life after that truth. Again, truth and opinions are two different things. I'm not really sure God has a lot of concern or desire to know your opinion and my opinion, especially if we're not following truth. What good does it do if you have this strong opinion that you feel that you can defend if, in fact, you're not obeying the truth that God has set before you? Do you know what that would mean? Your opinions have no value whatsoever. Worse than that, they could lead people into destruction. See, many people are thinking on the basis of their limitations. We're all limited. Nobody has all knowledge except the Lord. He's omniscient. He has all knowledge. He sees the future before it happens. Only he is the one you can trust for your future and for the truth that pours out of him, through him, in the word of God. So they didn't have to be united in their opinions, but they did need to to come in unity around the truth of a sovereign deity that gave man his word to follow and to obey in the unity of that truth. If as long as those of this country followed and submitted to the truth of their leader, as long as it was the truth of the living God, God blessed this nation. But when man decided to allow his opinions to prevail over God's truth, well, just look at the front page of the paper, step outside your house, take a look downtown into the uh, inner city, take a look at what's happening on the world stage. It's pretty clear everyone seems to be doing what they think is right in their own eyes. It actually says that without God's truth, man is left to do what he thinks is right in his own eyes, which brings forth the depravity of the fallen nature. The reason why now there's so much division and dispute isn't because this person believes this and that person believes that. They're not tolerant and, and, and they're not inclusive. The reason is they're following after their own finite, limited mental capability. But they are so blind in arrogance and in their haughty, proud-filled nature that they are convinced that what they believe is right. Once you're in a place like that, you're absolutely completely wrong. Yeah, you probably didn't like to hear that, did you? No, I know I'm right here. I remember saying that to God once. First thing he said to me after I said that was, how you're right is wrong. Let's not even get into the content. We'll get into the content next. How I'm right. I don't know if you can fit that in your reasoning, but sometimes the way we are right with other people is completely wrong. We've shut them down. We've pushed them away. And they don't, want to, they don't want to hear another word. The truth of God, he speaks it in love. Speak the truth of God in love, Ephesians 4.15. But what we have are people out there pounding the pavement and protest and pounding on the doors of institutions that they don't agree with. And they're saying, because you don't agree with my opinion and what I believe, I'm going to make your life miserable. If that isn't the evidence of an, a person who has fallen, who is filled with wickedness, I don't know what is. Such wickedness that would go out in tyranny and try to oppress people because they don't believe things the way I do. See, the reason the nation is now beginning to, to come apart, where the fabric is being ripped away, is because we're not on the position. We have no longer established the position of this nation on the truth and the sovereignty of God. Notice I didn't say religion. Religions are man-centered. Everybody has one. They're all different and they divide us. I'm saying to you what the Word of God says. It's settled forever in heaven. And anything outside of the Word of God, you're going to be in a deep, deep potential for being tripped up in life and not being set free of the very things that hold you captive. 
starting with the blindness in our minds. The Word of God says every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. He weighs every one of our hearts, yours and mine. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. In other words, are you going to act out in truth? Or are you just going to take your opinions and hit people over the head with them, even though they have nothing to do with the truth of the Word of God? A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. What does that mean? Plowing? Well, that's planting seeds. What comes out of seeds? Growth. What kind of seed is being plowed by the wicked? They beget after their own kind. Just take a look. These seeds are being plowed on what they're doing. And take a look. If you look at the Word of God and you look at where the wicked are sowing seeds, if it's anything against life, it's pure, complete wickedness. No, don't throw out the straw man. Well, there's this situation that. No, no. You are not sovereign. Neither am I. We leave life and death to the Lord. We do not be, we're not in that arena. And when we start exercising a right that we do not have, the proud wickedness comes over us, the pride-filled wickedness, and the blinding comes within us. And we are completely held captive by this evil and wicked spirit that has now come over this land. Anyone that is, tries to usurp or shut down someone from giving a position, especially if it's based on truth, you need to be deeply concerned about because that's the voice of Satan himself. He wants to silence anything except the lie. When Jesus confronted the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of lies. And the truth is not in him. Therefore, whenever the enemy speaks, he speaks of himself. He speaks of lying. When you see the deception that is going on out there, even at the top of the leadership of our nation and other nations, wickedness is just pouring through people, and there's no accountability. It's all prophesied in the scriptures that, that the days will come when justice will not go forth. It's not going forth. There are people found guilty over and over, but nobody, no one's holding them accountable. So that's Proverbs 21, verses 2 and 4. You know, this, this idea of, this, uh, of our nation coming together as many states, e pluribus unum, has, has thrived beautifully, and many nations have been blessed because of our nation. But now, this nation is under the very curse that caused the people to start this nation to run from. We now have the very curse within our own nation, within our own nation that we, we fled from in Europe and other parts of the world to get to this free country. It came, the enemy set up, and there are those now that embody the very things that people wanted to be free of in terms of their oppression. Everything man touches, he destroys, he contaminates. Everything, he corrupts. We don't, we don't want to hear the truth. We don't want to recognize that this is what's in us, in that sin nature. Except for the Spirit of Christ in us, there is no hope for anyone, anyone. So I want you to consider too that, do you remember that the United Nations, historically, were established right after World War II? You know what they tried to do? Just as the United States took the many different states to develop a nation that became one for peace and for unity, they thought, let's take the nations of the world as if they're individual states and let's bring them together and we'll make peace. Didn't work. Didn't work then. Didn't work all the way through. It's not working now. Because you see, there is such rebellion and, and a desire for each leader in their own nation to do what they think is right in their own eyes. I might add a verse uh, 14, 12 of Proverbs. It says, There seemeth a way that is right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Do you, do you know that probably most everyone you talk to, when they've got a, a position for you that you got to hear and you better hear them, they may even have right motive, but they're probably filled with wrong method. It doesn't matter how right your motive is and you're trying to get people to see things your way. If it's not right, 
It's wrong. Period. So ultimately, there seems ways that are right unto people in their opinions. This is the way it ought to be. But they're dealing oftentimes with this much information. And they're drawing conclusions with this much information. When that much information is out there, you're completely set up to be duped by the enemy. You are no match for his blinding power. He's extremely tactical. And we set ourselves up when we say, I've got this. I see this as clear as anybody can see it. No, I beg to differ. You don't. As a matter of fact, when you're convinced you see it clear, that's probably the time when the truth is most murky. Be very, very careful because it's pride and arrogance saying I see this that actually blinds you in the worst way. Let's not forget that it was five I wills in Isaiah 14 where Satan usurped the throne of God, attempted to take over the throne of God. I will rise above the sides of the north. Um, I, will, I, I will take the throne of the Most High. I'm paraphrasing now. Five times the creature decided he was going to subvert the authority of the Creator. He was so blind in all his power and all his glory in his creation as Lucifer, star of the morning, that it cost him everything. You think you and I are not subject to that same problem, especially since what happened in Eden? You think that sin nature is not constantly crouching at the door and the nature of flesh believing that we got this? That's when we mo are, are more wrong than we, never, than we ever thought we were. So this United Nations, it failed because it did not have Christ Jesus at the center of it. So regardless of how much we disagree with one another, ultimately if Christ is not at the center of it, it doesn't matter what you think or what I think. If Christ is not the center of it, we both fall, we both fail, and there's not anything that we're going to have to show for it. Fritz uh, Cherry wrote this, and I'm not familiar with him as a writer, but he, uh, he, brought it, he brought the truth as clear as you can bring the truth right here. Without God, you would have no life at all. Now think about what you just heard there. Without God, there's no life. He's the author and giver of life. God formed man from the dust of the ground in Eden, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It was the breath of God. It's called the pneuma, pneuma spirit, P-N-E-U-M-A. We get our word pneumonia from it in English. Why? We can't get our breath. <sighs> okay, pneuma, the breath of God comes in, and that's what brought life. So without God, there's no life. Think about it. Think about these points when you're thinking about doing life without God. Outside of Christ, there's no reality. Think of that. Nothing is going to be real to you. There's no reality. It's only Christ that brings purpose and reality into our lives. There's no logic. Now, how about all you intellects out there? You love to base things on logic and science. Good luck. Because it's only Christ that makes science what it is and logic what it is. He put the universe, he put it all together in the universal laws of physics and also the universal laws of the spirit. He made both the spiritual laws and the physical laws come together in the creation of this universe. Try that. Ask Darwin if he could do that. Well, he couldn't do that. And by the way, all those of you that believe all this came as a result of some sort of uh, the evolutionary process. Think of this. Imagine if you were born a hundred years before Darwin. What would you believe right now? You can think on that for a little while because if the truth that you base you, what your lifestyle on and, and your eternity on is less than 150 years old, you better find a real truth because that ain't truth and you know it. So there's no logic. There's no reasoning. There's no reality. No reason for anything. Everything was made for Christ. Everything. You were made for Christ. Your next breath comes from Christ and is to go back to Christ. What are you waiting for? If you don't know Christ, best get to know him because you have his breath in you. You, you may not have his saving spirit in you and it's time to ask for that because he's not going to push it. He's not going to force it. He's going, to, he's going to be a perfect gentleman. He's going to offer himself to you. He doesn't come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what Satan does. He came to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10. Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundant. Which, one, which God do you want? 
if, 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 if your religion or whatever it is you believe has nothing but death and destruction and, and all kinds of accusation and oppressing people and putting them at fear of their own lives, time to find it. If that's your God, it's time to get a different God because there is only one true God, not about the religions. Everybody says, which religion is right? Wrong question. It's not about which religion is right. It's about the who, it's not about the which. W-H-I-C-H. You can use that two ways. It's about the who. Who is your faith in? The one who came, born of a virgin, out of eternity past, the son of the living God, became the second Adam who had no sin in him and became the sacrifice for all of our sins. That we place our faith in him. We are cleansed and purified by the blood of Jesus Christ set on an eternal destiny beginning in this life for opportunities to have glory unfold in us and through us, the glory and the glow of God by his Holy Spirit, drawing us to him as others are drawn to him even through us. We must fully depend on Jesus. Without him, we have nothing, but with him, we have everything. When you don't have Christ, you have no power over sin, no power over Satan, <clears throat> and you truly don't have life. Death will own you. The fear of death will own you. Jesus even said in his earthly ministry, what shall it profit a man if, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you could somehow parlay all the wealth of the world, the minute you die, it stays right here where you amassed it. It was never yours to begin with. You may have been steward over it for a season, but it goes to someone else. It was James Elliott, who was a great missionary to the Aka Indians. And right out of missionary school, he, his life was taken. He was murdered by the very people he was trying to evangelize for Christ. <clears throat> when his friends heard he was going to South America to minister to them, they said, you won't last. They will kill you. He said these words. He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. That six months parlayed into six decades of ministry, of anointing, that although he was not on the field as long as those he went to school with, the impact of that ministry is still reaching people today, like this very hour, now. Be careful. How are you measuring your life? By what measuring rod? Is it to redeem the time as set forth in the word of God? Who are you measuring your life by? Is it some fallen human being? Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. Is it some national or world leader? Is it some person who has achieved great wealth, great fame, great ability? Is it some wisdom thinker who can wow you just by sitting at his feet, listening to him? Or is it the Christ who discipled you by his Holy Spirit and continues to, and to lead you into all truth, and who sacrificially went to a cruel cross for you so that you could be cleansed and purified by the finished work that he completed at Calvary? He said he came to do the work of his father. And that's what he did. He's asking you and I to do the work as our Abba Father that he has. He is our Abba Father, Romans 8, 15. Our affectionate Papa, our Savior. And that's the work he is giving to us. The Lord is our strength. He directs our lives. He is our deliverer. You need the Lord. Stop trying to live another minute without him. To close in a few of these verses, to put things in perspective, John 1, 3, God created everything through Jesus and nothing was created except through him. Jeremiah 10, 23, 
I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Do you know that all the plans that you make, whether you are intentionally bringing the Holy Spirit into it or not, the Lord is directing your steps in ways you never imagined? How do you know? You don't see the future. You can't control the people around you. You can't even control you for any length of time. You really think you're in charge? You're really in control? What about when that sickness comes? What about when that unexpected event comes? What about when everything tumbles and all of your faith was in the strength of your intellect, the wealth of your pocketbook, or the power of your position? It's all gone now. What do you have? But with Christ, if that's all you have, you have everything. Everything. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In this world, there are people that have never felt as lonely as they do now. And they'll go to bed at night in a home filled with family. But they're alone. They'll go to bed at night in the same bed with someone that they do care about. But they feel so lonely. This ends when you say it does. You do not have to be alone. Because there's only one who can fulfill the fullness that you need in your heart that you're not lonely anymore. Do you know it's possible to be alone and not be lonely? It's also possible to be around many people and be very lonely. The choice is yours. Jesus finished it all at Calvary. Do not fear or be dismayed. In Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Was there ever any dispute? There wasn't then, there isn't now, there never will be. We've exchanged the truth of God for the lie. We've embraced the lie as if it's the truth. We've rejected the truth as if it's the lie. The scriptures already had all the answers. No more. No more. The madness stops when you say it does. Christ's Spirit will come in and lead you into all truth. John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus is talking. Remain in me, Jesus said, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. The vine is where the life is. That's why Jesus is called the true vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Quote, Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You have a choice of nothing or everything through Christ where all things are possible. In Galatians 6, 3, for if anyone thinks he is something, When he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let's stop listening to all the pundits out there. Let's turn off the political lies and disgust. Let's go in and up. Let's look in and let the Holy Spirit meet us right here, right here at the deepest part of our hearts. And let him reveal the truth to us that the enemy has blinded us from. And once we see that truth, let us then obey it first by repenting for not trusting in God by walking in it and repenting of any other truth revealed of any bitterness or any resentment or any failure to trust God being led by his Holy Spirit. And let's let him show us, even in our worst trials and tribulations, as Job said, I saw things too wonderful that I knew not. May the wonderful of God descend upon you now as we pray. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let your wonderful spirit descend upon each listener now and in the days ahead. From the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, pour through with your presence the glow and the warmth and the glory of God to come through 
cleansing and purifying places in their soul from pain and violation and defilement and where the resentment of the seed of contempt and the root of bitterness have grown and bitterness and hatred and anger that you would cleanse and purify each one as they acknowledge to you that they have sinned against you by sinning against others and restore their souls, Lord. You, Lord Jesus, restoreth our souls. And we trust you now to take us places that we never imagined existed because of our full, complete trust in you. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.